Hello everybody and welcome back to World of Warships Legends. My name is Spartan Elite 43 and tonight we are back in the Kansas. So you might seem a little bit of a theme here. Yesterday the Iowa, today the Kansas. What's coming up next? Well I've got a, I've got a little bit of an idea here and that is to show off the end of each line respectively in terms of the American line in particular because I've been getting a lot of questions about it. Now some might call me a bit of an expert when it comes to American battleships and at least when it comes to playing American battleships because it is easily my favorite tree, right? Like I, I love my American battleships. I don't know why I enjoy them so much. I just do. People say I'm biased because I'm American. I think you're foolish because I like a lot of different ships that aren't American. Some ships I just get along with. The Americans are one of them. And by one of them, I mean an entire tech tree full of American ships because I don't really have bad American ships. I think most of the American ships are pretty solid. They're very consistent, which is my biggest selling point for a ship. Like, I like to take a ship out and know what it's going to be able to do. Right? But one of the questions I've been getting asked a lot lately is things like, is the Iowa worth it in 2024, which we answered yesterday, and I think, yes, absolutely, it is still just as nasty today as it's always been. Uh, somebody brought up the fact that it used to Citadel more than it does now, and I brought up the, or I should bring up the fact that, eh, I mean, back when the Iowa first came out, the game was still relatively new, there was a lot of problems that weren't addressed yet, one of them being armor interactions and shell interactions. So you could say that maybe by proxy the Iowa was nerfed, but it wasn't the Iowa particularly that was nerfed. The Iowa's AP damage was nerfed, but the shell interactions and stuff, the armor was changed overall on all ships, or at least a lot of ships. So that changed the way the game works, right? Fundamentally. But anyway, without getting too nerdy, we're going to get into what the difference between the Kansas and the Minnesota is for me. And why I prefer the Kansas over the Minnesota. Uh, mainly, it's because Minnesota's a tier 8. Why would I want essentially the exact same ship except for bigger, so it's easier to spot. Just as slow. Just as accurate question mark. Because I'm not sure that the Minnesota is actually as accurate as the Kansas seems to be. The Kansas is disgustingly accurate. Now you may have noticed that my, my build has gone back to the old school Kansas. I wanted this to showcase the the absolute like best accuracy possible out of the ships. I did the same thing on the um, Iowa. I did the same thing on the Minnesota. Changed my build back to a free-to-play build. You guys don't need any special commanders to make your ships just as good as this. <gasps> what is this? What do you mean? I'm running William Sims with a straight-up like accuracy build. So William Sims with um, flamble cannoneer, gyrating drill bits, reaching out XXL. Um, I can't ever remember the third perk. But either way, William Sims and my inspirations are Paolo de Revel, which is an Italian free-to-play commander, and guess who? Andrew Cunningham. You didn't get it. Why didn't you get it right? Well, those of you in the know know that the uh, one of the big issues with the French and the Americans is their shell grouping is not particularly good. I used to use Azure Lane Sharnhorst and think that that was the bee's knees, but no. The American battleships are accurate enough in terms of their overall accuracy, so their dispersion is pretty solid. The grouping is the thing that needs the most help, so going with Andrew Cunningham just makes sense, right? So I don't need any special commanders. I've reverted back to my original Iowa build. Now first shot coming around the corner on this hipper, I'm not gonna lie, I don't know if I maybe overled him just a slight a little bit, or if it was just that turn that he made at the right time to save his life. Because normally that's death for a hipper. At medium range, which is what I would consider this, any close range would be inside five kilometers, which he's about to get into. Um, medium range would be that above five kilometers to about 12 kilometers. And then beyond 12 kilometers is what I consider long range, right? But uh, Hipper pushes forward straight into us. And I don't know what he's thinking here. Like, 
I overmatch. I know how to do damage here. He's not gonna enjoy this, right? Like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sit by and let this man yellow rush me with torpedoes, which is obviously what he's thinking. Now, we also know that we're being farmed by uh, the King George over there. There's a cruiser over there, which I believe is in Indianapolis. And this Bismarck is, he's feeling some type of way about charging forward. Oh, and there just happens to be a destroyer here. Shocker. So we are going to farm this Bismarck and showcase why the Americans are simply better. I'm sorry. Like, you cannot YOLO rush into a battleship like this. Like, I don't care what battleship you're in. You YOLO rush like this, especially an American or a German, like, you're going to lose all of your hit points because all I have to do is aim for superstructure. The Germans and Americans have ridiculous amounts of hit points allocated to the superstructure. And they never seem to ever get saturated. You could just keep farming it over and over again, right? It's, it's one of the easiest things to do in the world. Now, Bismarck's in trouble. He has turned broadside to our teammate who has absolutely punched him in the face. He has taken torpedoes. He's burning or flooding or both. He's, he's in trouble, but he goes down. Shocker. Osterjolin decides to get himself spotted here, and so we are going to immediately target him because see a destroyer, shoot a destroyer. Now, pay attention to the positioning of the hipper on my left. Right? We know he's there. We're not stupid. He's obviously going to try to torp us if we decide to show that we're moving forward. So are we just going to yellow rush around the corner like a complete imbecile? No, of course not. We are going to start our turn away. Why? Why are we turning away? Simple. It gives us more time to get out of the way of the torpedo. Now, because we're pushing forward, and I know I probably could have shot this uh, this Indianapolis, but I knew that this guy was going to try to torp me. He's getting six torpedoes per side. Our cruiser was thinking about yellow rushing into, but uh, he sees the torpedoes, gets out of the way. But look at how easy it is to dodge these torpedoes now. What was the purpose there? Now, this Indianapolis has made mistakes with his life. He is firing at me instead of the cruiser, and he is just over-angled. This cruiser is yellow, or like yeeting his health very quickly because the cruiser learned how to use armor piercing. Despite being in a light cruiser, the cruiser just absolutely destroys him. Turns out, if you go broadside and somebody has AP loaded, you're gonna have a bad day. Especially when that somebody has like a six second reload or less, <laughs> depending on the build. Uh, but anyway, Cleveland mops up the Indianapolis, no problem. We still have the Jaeger out there on the right. Now, we have put up an, a respectable game of 90,000 damage, but this game is far from over, folks. But I want you guys to pay attention to what happens next. This is the part that everybody seems to get wrong. Everybody likes to talk about, like, they try to do the same things that I do, but they fail. Like, the... I'm not the greatest player in the world, but there is a skill difference between what I'm doing and what I'm able to articulate in the moment and what is actually going through my mind in these moments, right? So first of all, we've got a King George. We know we overmatch. He takes a bunch of torpedoes. He's slowing down. So we aim for the bow side plating. We absolutely crush him, right? No problem whatsoever. He's going to go down relatively quick. Now, we know the Jaeger's out behind us. We know that the Cleveland is there, but the Cleveland radars the Jaeger in a situation where he has no chance to shoot him. Again, I don't understand it. Now, maybe, maybe to the Cleveland's credit, he's like, okay, well, we have a battleships over there. Maybe we can radar the destroyer for the battleships and they can shoot him. Unfortunately, that's not the case. The, the, this was a misused radar. Something that I, dri I like, drives me crazy is seeing people misuse radars. At least he was in range to radar the guy. We do take a shot in the direction, but the odds that we hit that shot are slim and none, right? Now, the King George did go down, torpedoes but look at the torpedoes crossing our bow, right? That means there's a destroyer on the left. We knew that already because he'd already captured the Charlie Cap, right? But he's still there. Our destroyer is about to yellow rush around the corner. Destroyer has very low health. Now, we're going to take a couple of torpedoes here from the Osterjotland. It's literally nothing. We are, we are the thickest of thick, so we don't worry about those little tiny pea shooter torpedoes. Um, we didn't even take a flood from it, which is fantastic. But Yudachi does not have a lot of health, didn't start with a lot of health, and definitely doesn't have enough health to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, even with a Jaeger. Jaeger has more hit points and has a faster fire rate, so this is not going to end in his favor. Now, he decides he wants to torpedo, which is fine, I guess, but torpedo if he had held and waited for assistance, I could have helped him. 
but instead it comes down to us going around the corner on a Jaeger. I want you to pay attention to what happens next. Torpedoes, Watch me front. dodge these torpedoes. Now, you probably were thinking, well, Spartan, it's just a bad launch by that guy. He launched at somebody else. You have to anticipate those torpedoes, okay? You know the Jaeger's there. You know he has a reload booster for torpedoes. You know he has the potential to have 16 torpedoes at any given moment. And he can launch up to 32 torpedoes very, very quickly. So you have to anticipate those torpedoes. You know where they're coming from. So use the island to your advantage. Scrape off the torpedo turd blossoms. And then when he overangles and tries to get his torpedoes off, that's never going to end in his favor. But Spartan, why didn't you switch to AG? Because I don't need to. 12 armor-piercing rounds are going to be, in my opinion, more effective than switching to HE in that situation. I've, told, I've said it before, I'll say it again. One of the biggest issues that I have firing HE, especially out of the American battleships at destroyers, is that the HE tends to get absorbed by modules, AA guns, secondaries, torpedo tubes, turrets. It gets absorbed. It doesn't do full damage. Now, yes, you can and absolutely will do full damage, but uh, this Bismarck comes into this fight, he never has a chance. Like, we already showed one Bismarck that they're just not a good ship, at least not for a fight like this. Like, you're, you're going up against superior firepower, superior accuracy, and more hit points, and a person that knows how to angle, and your goal is to just keep going broadside as much as possible. Now, we farmed a superstructure once, so he goes full broadside to get all of the secondaries and primaries to fire. And then, of course, we're just going to finish them up. We're going to take a little bit of a hit here. Again, it's inconsequential. Down he goes. And because I'm a douche, I'm going to go ahead and hit the, the uh, damage control on a single fire because I don't want that Bismarck to get any more damage off of me. <laughs> and I figure I'm pretty safe from torpedoes, so I don't need any worry. Now, if I make one mistake during this entire ending of this match, it is this. I turned away. We know that the Oster Yeltlin was out there dealing with the, the uh, Cleveland. Cleveland has not been able to, like, pin him down. If only he would have been in position to shoot him when he had a Reuter. Just saying. But, I digress. Hasn't been able to pin him down. I start turning back towards the, the friendlies over here. My thought process was simple. If the Cleveland is headed back towards Alpha, maybe the Jaeger or the uh, Osterjotland has doubled back and is chasing these battleships across Alpha. Okay? I don't see any torpedoes currently, but it was a thought, right? That was my thought process. Once I realize that that's not what's occurring, I start to turn into the center of the map because I'm thinking, okay, at this point, maybe the Osterjotland's coming across the center to come for me. He's already shown interest in chasing me down, so who knows? Maybe he's coming for me. What actually is happening is the Osterjotland has gotten the f away from the Cleveland. He's like, I'm out. And he has gone over to Charlie and run straight into our destroyer, who, pr who immediately decides to start trying to torpedo him and immediately loses all of his hit points in the process. Now, once he gets his torpedoes off, he does start to shoot, but it's too little too late. You can see how much health he's already lost because of it. And uh, he does actually hit the Osterjotland with a torpedo, so more, more power to him. But I have to believe that if he's firing his guns, he probably kills this Osterjotland. The Jaeger is fully capable of killing him. But we take a shot and we hit all of the shells except for, like, we hit three shells. And the man lives. So I know this guy has no hit points left, right? Now keep in mind that I was just spotted for a short amount of time. And what happens next is hilarious. I start just driving straight towards this Osteola, and I'm like, hmm, I could take a shot and see if we can hit him. He's obviously not in the cap. I was expecting him to maybe turn into the cap. It's too late. He can't capture the base. He knows this. It's, it's just one of those situations where I was like, okay, if he does go in, I'm going to pre-fire this shot, right? Like, I already have it aimed in. If that base starts to tick red, I'm going to fire into this location and see if we can hit him. But, that's not what happens. Instead, I get complacent and I sail straight into a wall of skill from the Osterjotland. Like, we knew it was, we, we should have known it was coming, right? We were spotted. He, he just fires off some, sh some torpedoes in our, di our direction. And uh, he is going to hit us in three, torpedoes, direct two, front. one. Hello, torpedoes. 
Well, that's unfortunate. And of course, it gets the flood this time because it hits right on the snoop. But uh, this game's over, unfortunately. We're not going to get a chance to shoot him. Um, but let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. Do, are you liking this this amount of like? Are you liking these videos a little bit more, a little bit more in depth of what I'm thinking about, what's going on around me, rather than just trying to be full entertainment? Because uh, I, I, I can give a little bit of advice. I can, I can walk you through what's going on in my mind. I can walk you guys through like individual plays that are going on and why I do the things that I do in hopes to help you guys better understand what you could be doing better in the moment. Not saying I'm, a, I'm the best player. Never said I'm the best player. Simply saying that I've been around for a while. I know what's going on generally. And for the most part, most people can probably learn something. Okay? So, with that being said, 154,000 damage, Confederate, high caliber, and a dev strike, with 74 targets hit, top of the leaderboard, 2,877 base XP, not too shabby. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments below, and if you like what I'm doing, punch the like button, leave a comment below, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and as always, I will see you in the next video.